Hillary, it's lovely to meet you. Thank you so much for taking the time. It's wonderful. Thank you, Jessica. Looking forward to the conversation. Yes. Yeah, so listen, tell me, first of all, how you first got into the field of fashion in general before we drill down into your, your business that you're working on today. It actually was uh, kind of serendipitous. I was a professional tennis player, actually, before I worked in, in fashion. And I decided to go to college, long story, played in college. But when I left college, I really didn't know what field I was going into as an art history and studio arts major. So why I was trying to find, you know, kind of a, a role within that industry, I took a job at Kate Spade mm -hmm. uh, selling on the, on the floor. And that was kind of like my first kind of touch on fashion. And it was from there, I just I love the business side of fashion and my career just kind of grew from there, but it was an amazing environment to be in on the retail level to see all the moving parts of, of a fashion company. What was, what were the elements of the business side of fashion? Because there's so many people out there who they study fashion and they just, they love the creative side of fashion. So I'm always yeah. interested to hear about those people who have a preference for the business side. So what about that, particularly in fashion that you love so much? Well, I consider myself kind of a supply chain nerd. I, I think I realized really early on. Um, I always tell this story of going to the grocery store with my dad and, and being amazed of how people planned for milk to be in or even food that expires to be in a grocery store and, and how that actually the whole chain um, works. So I think once I got into an environment where I could apply that love of kind of like supply chain or that curiosity, I just kind of went wild. And so I was always really interested in the supply chain. And I think the numbers part came a little bit after, you know, I was somebody that liked basic math, but hated advanced math and was really good at just like numbers and ratios and things like that, just applied math. But, you know, I didn't really realize that that I was actually kind of good at that once I got in the, until I got in the environment. And so tell me about the moment when you um, went from working for somebody else to deciding that it was time to, to launch your own brand. I believe you were at, was it at, you were at DVF? No, maybe that's not right. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So once I, once I kind of got the fashion bug at Kate Spade, I did, you know, several different wholesale jobs. I actually, right, right from Kate Spade, I found the only, other, this was in Washington, D.C., I found the only other fashion job, which was working for May Company for Hex Department Store on the buying side. And that was amazing because back then they still had their training programs where you kind of go through and learn the retail math and learn the reporting and the analytics. And that was just you know, that training was what I used through the rest of kind of my career on the wholesale side. So then I switched, I worked, you know, guest jeans and then a Cynthia Steffi. And then I landed at Diane on Furstenberg, which is where I really kind of fell into my stride a little bit. It was, you know, one of the largest contemporary brands out there at the time. This is even pre-recession. And just to see that powerhouse of how it operates. And I was exposed to just kind of like all aspects from production to sales to merchandising. I, I absolutely loved it. You, um, it all. you took it all in. Took it all in. And from there, I went to run Rachel Zoe's launch for Lee and Fung, which was really amazing to launch a brand and to work in kind of a licensed environment with such a huge company like Lee and Fung. And again, serendipitously, a role came about, which was to run Kimberly Ovitz, which was one of the top women's contemporary brands at the time and, you know, kind of a, a designer on the rise. So that was really fun. And it was there that I had the idea for brand assembly, you know, just seeing somebody that maybe wasn't too constrained by finding finances and was able to have certain people on staff that maybe a, another designer might not have had that that luxury and so it was there where I decided to kind of like leverage resources to be able to package them for a price for smaller designers. So basically you saw an, an opening in the market where you could kind of step in and help designers who maybe didn't have the same cash flow as she did to give them the you know those you know pain point help that they would need correct? Exactly. Yep. So it was really, it launched as we called it order management and bookkeeping. And that was what we did. We helped these brands with all of their order management, which meant like taking in their orders, entering them into a central ERP system, helping them analyze the data. Mm -hmm. So taking that data and running it different scenarios so that they can be more nimble and quicker on decisions, especially when they're in market 
or production and buying fabric. So we're able to apply, you know, and, and buying into an ERP system is not necessarily inexpensive for designer. So to be able to leverage that was, was really strong. And then just bookkeeping, basic bookkeeping, which I know everybody really does not like to do. Um, <laughs> they probably actually despise it, but it's that kind of process that's important and to set up really early on in a brand's kind of trajectory because if you want to scale or say you want investors to go back and fix that work you know over years and years of bookkeeping is you know more costly and and more time consuming than it is to set it up correctly from the beginning do you have a hard time convincing brands for that for that because i see so many young designers out there that it's just like the last thing on their mind that they you know the idea of being, like i said it's not sexy how do you how do you you know engage with them in a way that they can relate to it or, or the same thing with data some people with data it's just they don't understand it they don't want to they want to pretend they understand it, but they don't. They feel really uncomfortable. How do you make people feel comfortable and understand the importance of what you're doing and what you can offer them? Yeah, I mean, in full transparency, it's not an easy thing to sell to mm -hmm. these designers, you know, because they think that they're getting by with what they can do. And, you know, they're just trying to save money in any possible place within their business. So it actually is a really hard thing to sell. But once we get over that that hump of selling it, it's almost like they can't live without it because it really is beneficial for these brands. You know, they can make this, like I said, they can make decisions faster. They're able to go to factors or financial institutions for loans because things are organized better. And if that's the case, it's definitely worth the investment. But yeah, full transparency, it's not the easiest thing to sell. Well then, so you so you started with this bookkeeping and kind of um, traceability with the data points, which, I, which is great because it can give you such great insights and especially if you're in control of your own data but then so how did it evolve because I know you have showrooms you have the square you have you have all of these different touch mm -hmm. points so tell me a little bit about the evolution of the company definitely so when we launched the back office kind of simultaneously we launched the trade show in Los Angeles when I was working for Rachel Zoe she obviously is basically the mayor of of fashion in LA so it seems like the right decision to start to try to sell the product during the LA market. And just to be frugal, I asked a couple of my colleagues, you know, that work for other brands if they wanted to share space in the Cooper Design Space building, which is kind of like 11 floors of, of multi-brand showrooms and single brand showrooms. Um, there was no trade show at the time. So mm -hmm. You know, we we shared space. Then, just being type A as I am, you know, I just started to arrange the furniture and you know put it all together. And then it went from like three brands to five brands to eight brands. And so while I was working on the back office components, I was like, whoa, I was like, there's obviously a need for shared space. This is post recession now. So regional markets started to be important because people didn't want to necessarily travel as much or travel to New York four times a year. They only want to do New York twice a year. So we saw the importance of the regional market kind of come back. And when I launched the business, I was like, I will, I might as well make this part of the business too. And now we have close to 250 brands brands for our LA trade show during our large market. And we launched New York about two and a half years ago. And we have gone into Dallas as well. I and mean, we've been in Dallas for about a year and a half. So then from there, we have the co-working space, which we call the square. And that evolved because we had LA, it was awesome. The trade show was killing it. But New York, I just didn't think that our brand recognition was there to be able to, I don't want to say compete, but to be effective mm -hmm. enough um, against you know, like a coterie or these larger, these larger trade shows and the New York trade show market is, was, and still is very, very saturated. So I didn't think that we would make an impact. So I was trying to solve a problem of brands wanting to show their product for longer periods of time instead of just like three days, because as an emerging designer, you usually fall to the bottom of the appointment chain during, during market, unfortunately, and people, buyers run out of time and maybe they're coming in from a different city they they just you know unfortunately they they kind of fall by the wayside yeah yeah so I wanted to set up a space where brands could share all year round and feel comfortable that they had longer days or longer times that they could show their product to the buyers and that's where this kind of show 
shared showroom environment originated from, and it evolved to be strictly that, like a showroom type uh, environment to be a mix of showroom and open co-working space for people in the fashion industry. So that's kind of that how that evolved. And we also opened one in Los Angeles as well. And so what would you say, you know, looking at the environment today, what, what would you say, I mean, because showrooms, it's going to be difficult to do those kinds of things. How are you as a brand evolving in this, you know, the coronavirus economy that we're, we're rolling into at this point? I mean, I, you type A, you clearly think on your feet. So what's, you know, what's popping in your mind as to how you're going to pivot? Yeah, I mean, so I, I, I say that I've been through like the seven stages of grief and what <laughs> the, are, is like this like eight weeks now, I think, of, of quarantine because we had just come off completing our LA market, which was our largest, you know, our, our dates, I think were like March 13th through the 15th. So like, right as we finished, like everything just shut down here in the United States. So I was like, oh, we our next trade shows in June, no problem. You know, like it will be resort time, we'll all be fine. And then, you know, like, the second week came, the third week came, and it became more of a reality that our June trade show in Los Angeles wouldn't happen physically. So we had been thinking of what a digital environment would be like as a complement, and I want to emphasize complement to what we do in the physical sense, because our DNA really is about transacting in person and those close relationships. And We just wanted to brainstorm something to launch actually at the end of the year that would be a compliment and a form of discovery for retailers prior to coming to market so that they have a little bit more kind of knowledge going into it, even though we love the sense of discovery in the physical sense. So obviously that's been a little bit escalated during, because yeah, of this. That up. <laughs> yeah, because of, because of uh, COVID. So we will be launching a digital product in June. It won't be in its complete form, but we're kind of like working out those details at the moment. But just in the spirit of brand assembly and connecting people, we will also have some content that will be virtual, you know, whether it's fun showroom walkthroughs with designers, a panel discussion through Zoom, So looking at that content that we're going to put together on the dates that we would normally have our resort trade show, which is June 15th, 16th, and 17th. So kind of putting some things together because we finally accepted that June wasn't going to happen in the physical sense and now putting together, you know, but we didn't want the time to pass by without doing something connecting our brands and our retailers. You're selecting the brands. Is it, you know, do you have a selection process of the people that you want to represent as a company or is it, you know, whoever whoever is there and ready to go is, is okay by you and can come into the it can come in and, and be part of the presentation part of the space how do you are you are you curating I guess the space and, and the brands that you're working with yeah I would say that brand assembly has become known to be a place of discovery mm-hmm. and we're women's contemporary you know I would say when we first launched seven years ago actually seven years uh, our anniversary was yesterday you know we we really look at a different mix of of brands. Um, It was really important because we're a smaller trade show that we wouldn't have too much cannibalization within certain categories. So we didn't want a sea of denim or a sea of t-shirt. So it's really, we take the editor's eye of a retailer coming in and they don't necessarily have to leave that space because everything is so tightly edited. You know, they can buy for a lifestyle store. They can buy for a denim store if they want it to. But, you know, within those categories, there's not too much cannibalization going on. You know, if we have denim, it's a vintage looking line. It's a sexy European line. So we really make sure that we're, we're really taking that, that curated eye. What are you thinking about the conversation about the whole idea of less seasons, you know, actually, you know, buying and shopping in the season that we're in, as opposed to six months ahead of time, you know, the way that fashion actually functions today. What, um, what would you like to see change or, or how would you, how do you predict that things are going to pivot in the future or going to advance in the future that you think will be much more in keeping with the new times? Definitely. I mean, I've said this a couple times through this, this seven week process of, I actually think the silver lining in this mm-hmm. is that I think the industry will evaluate things for the better, you know, and, and I am old enough to have been in this industry pre pre recession and, and post recession. And obviously the digital aspects has changed 
ex exponentially since you know pre-recession. So there is that factor. But before, if anybody remembers, before you know the recession, things were a little bit more slow. They, you know, it was not so many brands. It was markdowns were more regulated, especially in Europe. I mean, Europe had markdown cycles just twice a year, which I think was amazing. But then obviously the internet age and, and shopping online changed all that because you have exposure to, to so much more. So I think that this really presents an opportunity to rethink that, you know, since post-recession, the fire sales and flash sales really kind of caused this inventory issue and need to fill inventory deliveries you know, all the time, go, 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 go. And I think this might shake out some of that, uh, which I think is a, is a good byproduct of an unfortunate situation. We've been talking about, you know, buy now, wear now for a while. And it worked before, you know, pre-recession to be able to buy your investment pieces in February. Like, let's go shopping and let's put it in our closet to where we can wear it in spring. Like that was, that was part of the joy of, of shopping. And that, that has changed because now when you actually want to wear it, things are marked down 60% off. So I really do hope that that changes. I know that a lot of people are talking about it right now. It's really hard to change a, a massive infrastructure, but the power of like the individual brand right now to kind of make their own path and, and do what they want, I think is is really important right now. Yeah, I mean, I, we can see what happened back in the day when Burberry, you know, decided to go digital and, and you know, and do the see now by now and, and was very much avant-garde and pulled the rest of the fashion world in a direction that a lot of them went kicking and screaming in that direction and didn't want to do it. And I think that you're seeing the same thing with maybe caring would be an example with the sustainability aspect and really moving more in yep. the sustainability part. I want to circle back and talk a little bit. I always like to ask my guests, like, if there was a moment in your career and in the launching of your company where you made a misstep or you made a wrong decision and how you learned from that and pivoted and, and adjusted and, and took those, you know, took away from that something that you helped you in the future. Because I think that's always a great thing because I don't think there are any mistakes. I think it's just all about learning new things. Yeah, I mean, I would be, I've made a lot of, of mistakes, but one thing kind of comes to forefront is when we launched our, our Dallas show, you know, it was, I was kind of looking in the market. We had, we had LA, it was really successful. We just started to dabble in New York and we had all these people that loved our show environment being like, why don't you do San Francisco? Why don't you do Dallas? Why don't you do Atlanta? And so I, I decided to be like, okay, if they're asking for for these things, there must be a need. And I did do, you know, some market research and talking to some brands and, you know, flying to San Francisco and, and Dallas to kind of see what I think would be the biggest opportunity. But I definitely didn't do probably my due diligence enough in the sense of what market would be the best to launch. And we did Dallas and we went kind of went rogue and, and did our own event space. And knowing that we had to really put a lot of effort into kind of retailer acquisition and, and letting them know that we were going to be in Dallas. But what I didn't know is how set in their ways the Dallas retailers are and wanting to just go to their buildings and, and do that. So we had a trade show that we soft launched in a resort time, which was like somewhat successful. But then the next one was kind of disastrous and it was you know so uncomfortable you know to have all these brands looking at you being like where are all the retailers and it really was a humbling experience I feel like at that time brand assembly was kind of climbing you know with the la show growing you know year after year season after season and <laughs> to then just go to a city and have no one show up was like really really humbling but it made me it made me realize that you know there has to be this isn't something that you just pop up in a market it really has to be months and months of prep in terms of having retailers understand that a new market is happening you know because i always have these kind of aspirational or dreams of going to all these emerging markets within the US. But that's the biggest part of making a trade show successful is having the retailers come. So of course. definitely, definitely a big learning experience for me. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a tree in the forest. If you know, it's there to hear it you know, fall. And yeah. No, absolutely. Well, it was also... 
it was also kind of funny because during this market, you know, we were close to where the other market was going on and we figured that we would rent like golf carts or something to shuttle retailers back and forth. And that would help like the whole, the whole marketplace. And we called the Dallas police and see if golf carts were legal on streets or sidewalks. And yeah, they're like, yeah, no problem. No problem. And then when we get there, like the, one of the police like pulled one of our golf carts over. I was like, what are you doing? You can't have golf carts on the street. I was like, yeah, but the, the police department said it was a whole, it was a whole ordeal, but learning lesson, golf start, golf carts, not legal on Dallas streets. <laughs> that would be the big takeaway from our golf Yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> Talk to me because you're talking about expanding out to Dallas or into other cities. You mentioned, you know, San Francisco, et cetera. Talk to me about how you're doing the personal branding for your company, because that is today, especially now in the, in the new climate that we're in, the storytelling of your own brand is so important. So can you talk about your own brand as an example, maybe to brands that you represent, what to do um, to really get your name out there, to get that recognition so that when you come, come knocking, that people have that name recognition and know who you are. Yeah, so we want, I mean, we are, um, I don't want to say we want, because we have already established ourselves, ourselves as kind of the, the resource center for small, emerging, mid-size, mid-size brands. You know, I don't want to say one-stop shop, but like you can get services, uh, you can, you know, connect with retailers, you can work, all those things are under the brand assembly umbrella. And over the last year, I would say we've done an amazing job at really driving home that aspect that, you know, or like saying that we are this resource center. We did a rebranding last year that has this icon system that is a derivative from our main logo that emphasizes the trade shows, brand assembly show, the reassembled show, then the square, and then the faculty, which is which what we call our, our resources, our, sorry, our um, managed services. So to really have that visually represented, I think has really come a long way in the last year. We also brought on a marketing team. My CMO, Adele Tatanko, has been absolutely amazing in terms of getting that messaging across. And, you know, I'm just so happy, you know, where we've come from and where we are now in terms of brands really knowing, and even retailers really knowing who we are and all the things that we do. I mean, we're even seeing submissions from retailers that need bookkeeping help. Yeah. And, you know, that wasn't necessarily something that was on my radar when I first started the company in terms of doing bookkeeping, but it's something that we can 100% do. So that's an exciting byproduct of, of our, mar our marketing efforts over the last year. Yeah, because it's incredibly difficult for a company like yours, because I, I worked for many years at Launchmetrics, and, and they do many, many different things for the fashion industry. So it's very, you don't have an elevator pitch for that kind of a company when you do so many different things. So it's very, yeah. messaging can be very, very complicated when you're, you, it's not one idea that's really clear and crisp, when you can offer so many different you know, a penalty of, of options. Um, speaking of, of things that you offer, what aren't you offering that you really want to offer? Or the thing, the next thing on your list that you're really like, oh, if we could like bring this in, that would be so amazing. That would just kind of complete the circle. Yeah, we've been talking a lot over the last year about expanding our services. So we obviously have the logistics and operations and bookkeeping. But on my team, we have some amazing people that can do merchandising, business plans, you know, just even also consulting because the logistics and bookkeeping is just so packaged. Like that's, that's the offering, but people have questions, people need, you know, one off. So really expanding those services. But I would say the one um, that I wish we had right now was kind of digital marketing expert, you know, on our team, because we do have a lot of people that are coming to us, uh, especially now to understand what they can do to further their reach uh, or acquire customers digitally. And that's not necessarily like our expertise at all. So I would love to add that as a service in the, in the future. Yes. Um, I mean, that seems to be the way digital marketing, I think is very much the, is the, one of the things you have to have that as a component um, that, and I think, some sort of a sustainability aspect, I think, going into the future, that's definitely going to be another big thing as well. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, we have retailers coming to us, you know, which of our brands are sustainable, you know, and we do efforts in terms of how we market that uh, to our retailers, also marking them in our show guides as being sustainable. So that's a really, really important conversation. I think also now as the fashion industry evolves into what hopefully is more of a, a slow approach, mm -hmm. that the meaning behind 
a purchase is going to be so much more important. No, I agree. I think that people are going to buy less and be more thoughtful about what they buy. I think that, I think, and, and tell me if you agree that there needs to be um, a connection to a brand. When you talked about having a brand stay in a longer time in your space, there is this feeling that before somebody actually wants to buy something these days, they want to have the backstory, have a connection, have an experience with the brand before they actually go to purchase. So it's like that you have to see a logo seven times before you it registers in your brain. I mean, I don't know what your thoughts are about that. I mean, that's how I kind of also started a brand assembly is I, I started to really fall in love with these smaller designers that had these great stories. And it was things that I couldn't find on the floor of Saks or, you know, even in the long list of brands that shop up has and Instagram was a big part of that and finding and finding these brands, you know, so I think the storytelling and the person behind the brand is going to be so much more important. And I actually, even in our brands for our trade shows, I have brands asking, Oh wait, should I as a designer be there selling? Isn't that, you know, something that, that retailers don't like. And I was like, no, they actually really like that because they're investing in you as a person, you know, that's a mentality that was, you know, ages ago, you know, like, you know, we've never allow, allow the designer in the showroom, but now, you know, there's so many brands that the retailer just wants to invest in that, in that person and fall in love with that person and, and fall in love their story. So I see that a lot. Fantastic. Is there anything else you want to tell the world about your brand and anything else that they should know before we, I ask you my five generic fashion questions? No, I mean, like I said, we, we really are here to support the emerging community. Um, you know, we launched the Slack channel a couple weeks ago, which has been really helpful of resources, good reads, but also just like lightheartedness, sharing some funny memes, you know, really sharing some COVID resources that are really important. So we're really just about that, that community and connection. And during this time, we just want to be there to be able to help the designer community and retailer community. Well, that's a, that's a great message to end on this. So now here we go for my five generic fashion questions. So the okay. first one is, what is your favorite piece of clothing that you own? Oh gosh, my multiple pairs of jeans. I have a thousand jeans. So oh. I wear jeans every single day. I can't, I can't name one, but oh wait, I, I did get this new pair of vintage Jordache jeans with zippers on the ankles with little bows. So an acid washed. So oh. I'd say right now that's my favorite. <laughs> that sounds like a great 80s throwback to me. That sounds like a good one. Oh yeah. Okay, super. If there was, you know, a lot of fashion is quite expensive. If a woman or a man was to invest, a, you know, a certain amount of their income in a piece, what would you recommend that be? What would be that one kind of big ticket item that they should invest in? I would say something that you can wear with every outfit. So even if you have this, this great dress, like a leather jacket, I see those things that you can wear over something and, and wear it with multiple different looks. It would be the best investment that you could have. Um, that's how I, I also shop as well. Who is your favorite designer, living or dead? Right now, emerging, I love Suzanne Ray, um, is one of my one of my favorites that's in the kind of the emerging space. I would say well known. I'm gonna go with like a Margella. Nice. That tells me yeah. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what trend will you never follow? These are so interesting. I haven't thought about this stuff in a while. I would say the those platform dad sneakers. Mm -hmm. that that were big last year yeah, yeah. The, the dad the dad sneakers definitely not on my on my list to buy <laughs> I can understand why um and then my, my <laughs> final question um for you uh, is what do you love most about fashion I love the people I love interacting with people I love talking to people I love the creativity behind people. So I just say it's, it's all that as far as connections are concerned. Hillary, thank you so much. It has been a pleasure and I hope to see you in LA or in, the, in, the, in live and in person at some point in the future. I do too. Um, like I said, there's lots of silver linings during this time and I hope that everybody finds their own, you know, because I think that this will just make everybody stronger and come out the other side, you know, just, just a little bit more well-informed. Thanks so much, Hillary. It's been lovely. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Jessica. Bye.